Hello. Okay, it's working. <coughs> Dear Permanent Secretary, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, dear colleagues, dear friends, Huva Paiva, bonjour, and Tervetuloa, welcome. I am Gael Yorye Bolat. I'm the director of the Ranskan Institutin, the uh, French Institute in Finland. And today I have the honor to be the moderator for this um, opening session. I would first and foremost like to thank the people and institution without which this, con uh, this conference would not have been possible, Citra, our Finnish partner who is welcoming us today, the French Embassy and Metropolia University who is live broadcasting this event and I take this opportunity to welcome everyone who is watching online. A warm thank you also to all our keynote speakers, panelists and moderators for being with us this afternoon. We have a lot to learn from you and I'm very much looking forward to, hear, uh, to hearing your experiences, insights and recommendations on such an important subject. I would also like to mention that this conference is part of a series of conferences on globalization and inequalities financed through the Programme d'Alembert by the French Institute in Paris. So it is hence one of the, fourth, one of the four events organized on this theme uh, with, together with Stockholm, Oslo and Copenhagen. The Programme d'Alembert indeed aims at uh, promoting bilateral discussion and debate on society issues and I think that we are perfectly fitting in those objectives today with the French, uh, French and Finnish expert expertise that we have with us. As I know that this conference will make you want to discuss more with all the great guests that we have with us this afternoon, I would like to remind you that you are all welcome to the reception that we are organizing at the Institut Francais right after this conference. And without further ado, I am now delighted to introduce you to Hanne Le Poca, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of the Environment. The floor is yours. You. Your Excellency, uh, Your Excellency, ladies and, and gentlemen, first I want to thank you, uh, dear Mr. Ambassador, and Embassy of France and French Institute and CITRA and all other uh, organizers who have been possible that we are sitting here and, and uh, taking part to this uh, uh, important event. Um, it's good to see you all here. Uh, uh, dear friends, we need to think about the the whole economy in a revolutionary way. The current linear economic model does not provide effective solutions to achieve the global commitments of the Paris Climate Agreement or the 2030 Agenda for, for Sustainable Developments. Radical transportations in energy supply and use are needed to keep the global temperature increase to below 1.5 degrees centigrade, as had been underlined in the uh, latest IBCC special report. But, as we all know, this is not enough. We also need to rethink our resources use and focus on the full life cycle of products. Today, the extraction of materials is over 80 billion tons per every year. Only 7% is reused or recycled by the uh, global economy. Material management through our economies is estimated to account for two-thirds of the global emissions. We need urgently a new mindset, an ambitious vision a commitment and an implementation strategy to meet the global commitments. A systemic transition to circular economy is an excellent strategy and tool to steer the world towards climate resilient and inclusive sustainable development. To make it happen, strong leadership is required from governments and businesses. 
the governments must create a, a supportive operational environment for companies and markets. Then pioneer businesses will lead the way. We believe that circular approaches boost green investments, partnerships and innovation. But as importantly, circular economy has the potential to create new jobs and income, thereby contrib contributing to people's well-being. Uh, here in, in Finland, Finland wants to lead the transition towards circular economy by example and concrete measures. With our action plan for a circular economy, uh, we provide uh, incentives for sustainable and innovative public procurement, new product and services, uh, service innovations, and circular economy investments. In our recently published national plastic roadmap, we focus on concrete measures. Such actions include financial support for plastic re refineries, sustainable substitutes of plastic products, products by wood, and re recovery of microplastics from wastewaters. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, the world cannot survive without moving to a circular economy. The change in our mindset, ambitious policies, and innovative businesses will foster the change from fossil pipeline economy for a circular bio-based economy. It will bring economic prosperity, human welfare and health, new jobs and a better environment. This is crucial for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and all these um, climate uh, decisions which we have together made in, in Paris. We must all be a part of this change. I look forward to the interesting presentations and, and the lively discussions today. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kitos. I am now pleased to introduce you to Marie Ponsar, the di uh, Director of Carbon Neutral Circular Economy at Citra. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants and friends, I am so happy that we could organize the Circular Economy Conference here at Citra today. So this truly is an international conference. And as we know, many countries across the world, including France, Finland, the Netherlands, for example, have already prepared their own circular economy action plans or national roadmaps. And these national action plans or roadmaps, they are very important uh, as a starting point. But what we need is to have more close collaboration between the different countries. And that is one of the reasons why we are here today. So last week, CITRA and <clears throat> Minister of Environment of Japan organized the second World Circular Economy Forum in Yokohama, Japan. And, and the event and the discussions, they were very, uh, I would say, successful. We had over 1,000 participants from 80 different countries, and we agreed that the next World Circular Economy Forum will be held here in Helsinki in Finland next June, and the 2020 Forum in, in Canada, and then we can continue the international dialogue. So, at the latest last week, it became very clear to me that the transition towards the circular economy, which is more restorative and regenerative model of our economy, uh, is not only inevitable, but it is already underway. A lot is happening in different countries across the world. And last week we also discussed that actually the global sustainability crisis that our world is encountering today has three dimensions. One dimension is the climate crisis, 
the second di dimension is biodiversity crisis, and then the third is the overuse of natural resources crisis. And it is very important that we face the culprit of these crises, which is the ever-growing consumption of materials and energy, and also the unsustainable use of natural resources. So we should not only try to de uh, treat the consequences, for example, climate change or biodiversity loss, but we must uh, cure and treat the root cause itself. And the circular economy actually is the solution. And actually, it also became very clear to me that there is a fourth dimension in this global sustainability crisis that we need to address, and that is the crisis of social inequality. So we must really build a circular economy that is also fair and inclusive. And I'm very happy that we are going to discuss about this today. It is very high on our agenda. And as uh, Mrs. Bocca already mentioned, so circular economy is also a powerful tool in emission reductions. And it is very important that the circular economy is embedded in all the climate policies and climate strategies. Because without material efficiency and circular economy, we are not able to meet our climate targets. But circular economy is not only a, a, a powerful force for solving the global sustainability crisis. It can really be a source of well-being, prosperity and economic growth. And we know that uh, Actually, transition towards the circular economy, as I mentioned, is an inevitable. And in Japan, we agreed, or Finland and Japan agreed, that these two countries will advance the global circular economy in future. Japan, especially when they have the G, uh, presidency of G20 starting next year, and Finland during its EU presidency, which will start in July uh, 2019. And I know that France is at the same time, or has the presidency of, of G7. So it would be excellent to form a strong coalition of these three countries who have these special presidencies and really advance the global circular economy together. So I'm very happy that you all are here today and on behalf of Citra, once again, most warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Serge Tomasi, the Ambassador of France to Finland. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yes. Dear Permanent Secretary, Anela Poca, Dear Director on Circular Economy, Marie Pansard, Madame la Directrice de l'Institut Français de Finlande, Cher Gaël, Your Excellency, Dear Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to start by thanking CITRA for co-organizing this public conference with France. This conference is an example of our bilateral cooperations, I would say our excellent bilateral cooperations with Finland and with uh, CITRA in particular. Last year, the first World Circular Economy Forum was organized here in Finland by CITRA, and it has been an exceptional opportunity for companies, researchers, NGOs, experts from all sectors to meet and discuss on this important topic. Last week, in Japan, was organized with CITRA the second forum. Of course, France actively participated in these two first World Circular Economy Forums. The transition towards a circular economy is a key project to promote an ecological, social, and economic transition. The traditional model, producing, consuming, discarding, is leading us towards the depletion of the planet's resources. Currently, every week, I could say every day, we are facing new events and receiving new reports highlighting the huge impact of climate change and the environmental degradation. 
Therefore, we must urgently move for towards a new economic model where we consume in moderation, where products have a longer lifetime, where we limit waste, and where we are able to transform waste into new resources. To reach our goal, we have to invent new and more sustainable production and consumption patterns. While the 20th century enabled us to increase dramatically labor productivity, we need in this 21st century to get higher productivity in the use of resources. This is a key priority taken into account the dramatic increase of global population. In this context, French government launched in October 2017 a comprehensive and inclusive process reflections with the objective of producing a French circular economy roadmap. All stakeholders involved have worked in different workshops, businesses, NGOs, municipalities, government agencies, experts. These workshops have been organized to identify the most relevant tools to meet the objective of the roadmap and also the practical ways of implementing them. They have been complemented with online public consultations. The French roadmap was then published on April 2018. It is based on four approaches, better produce, better consume, better manage our waste, and mobilize all stakeholders. Concrete steps have already been taken. The roadmap is being deployed within the territories. Voluntary commitments and community initiatives are encouraged, and legislative measures through the transposition of the new European Waste Directive will be adopted by the end of 2019. Beyond our actions at the national level, as you say, France is committed to play a constructive role in the shaping of our planet's future. Following the adoption of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change at COP21 and the launch of two key global initiatives, such as Make Our Planet Great Again, dedicated to science and researchers in the fight against climate disruptions, and the One Planet Summit, whose second edition just took place some weeks ago in New York, France will organize the Plastic Summit on the sidelines of the Environmental Council in March 2019. Dear colleagues, innovation, research, and international cooperations are essential to face the current challenges and to shape a better future for the next generations. I therefore wish full success to this conference, which again highlights France and Finland cooperations. Thank you for your commitment and for your attention. Merci. This is now time for the first uh, keynote speech. So please join me in welcoming Alexandre Lemille, founder at Wise Impact and co-founder of the African Circular Economy Network. He has been involved with circular economy since 2011. Recognized by the World Economic Forum as highly recommended in the circular economy leadership category in 2016, he was also listed as top 25 innovative person by change hackers for his, for his circular human sphere. He is also a visiting lecturer at uh, Sciences Po Paris and at the University of Cape Town. His keynote speech will focus on beyond circular economy, reducing inequalities, applying the circular thinking on the context of globalization. Mr. Lemire, the, the floor is yours. Merci. Mr. Ambassador, Mrs. Uh, Minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here today 
Thank you, Kari. I appreciated your invitation since we met in Uruguay and you believe in what circular economy 2.0 could bring. And I will explain that to you today. Uh, thank you, Citra and the French Embassy for, and the French Institute for organizing uh, this event today. The circular economy is often depicted as the next economic model. The circular economy has the power to bring us to the safe operating space. But what about the just operating space? NASA, the spaceship agency uh, from America, just announced two days ago that humanity might disappear by 2100 because of two issues, resource mismanagement and social inequality. So I believe it's about time to wake up as humanity and start addressing these issues from, from today onwards. So I will explain to you how can we include inequality as a concept in circular economy, because today it's not embedded. Today, circular economy do not ensure equal access to the economy to all of us as humans. And this is about time to design an economy which creates well-being for all of us, no matter who we're we coming from. So let's use the, what I call the circular thinking to also apply it into the missing social dimension. What is inequality? Well, it's often explained as financial inequality, uh, a mix of uh, wealth uh, distribution, income disparities, and consumption patterns. Beyond financial inequality, and this is just depicted here in what we call the elephant graph of uh, global inequality, this is published every year by the World Inequality Database, uh, weed.world, uh, if you want to check uh, the, the information, and you see that the, the head of the elephant is the 50% of the population grasping 12% of the current economic growth. The middle uh, of this elephant is us, the US and Western uh, European uh, societies. We are in our middle class and we are not grasping growth any longer. And obviously the famous top 100, which is a, a scandal every year in January when Oxfam published its number, uh, grasping the top 1% of, of people, uh, grasping uh, 30%, nearly 30% of the economic growth every year. So, if we want a next economic model, we better address inequality at the same time. How can we do that? Well, uh, there's nothing stronger and higher than nature. When we look at natural ecosystems, all resources and all energies are flowing in an optimized way in our ecosystems. Every single element in nature, every single living being in nature has a specific function or role to play. So why not us humans? Why have we created these walls between us? So how can we activate those functions so we make sure that the next economic model answer the question, what's in it for me? Because if you don't answer the question, what's in it for me? Obviously, Finland is one of the most equal economy in the world. So, and you have water access, you have not so much trouble with the weather, so why caring? But this is not about Finland today, this is about designing an economic model that works for everyone. And obviously the poorest people on the planet. So how can we ensure that circular economy is embedded with inequality as a principle within it? Today it's not. The circular economy is often depicted as the uh, butterfly diagram, where it, it, at the center you have the linear, the linear economy spine, and we are trying to create feedback loops from the green part of the graph, which is the biosphere, the, the natural ecosystem, and uh, feedback loop from the technosphere, which is our economy, the, the material, the, the, the technical nutrient, as we call them. And the idea is to create those, those virtuous uh, feedback loops so that we recover and we manage resources responsibly. Uh, 
But this is the Nexus environment economy. There is no social dimension here. We are just consumers and users. Once again, we are seen as consumers and users. Can we have other roles to play to save uh, humanity? The planet will still be there. Linear economy has generated a lot of scarcity issues. In circular economy, we often explain that this, is, this has led to some resource scarcity. We are 7.5 billion, we might not have enough resources to feed and to bring uh, the needed uh, goods to 11 billion people. Either we might not or we cannot, because if we extract, we will, ex uh, we will uh, generate so much CO2 that uh, it won't be a livable planet. In circular economy, waste is at the core of the concept. We design waste out by designing those feedback loop uh, so that we don't waste anymore. Waste is an invention of humans. Waste never existed in, the, in nature. We have created this concept of waste. But we have created another concept. We have created the concept of poverty in the social dimension. While waste is considered as the root cause of our environmental challenges, poverty should be considered as the root cause of our social challenges. Both poverty and waste should be designed out in our next economic model. And it could make sense. It could make business sense. In the spirit level book, we learned that inequality and poverty is not good news for business. So why can't we embed poverty at the same time? While we have millions of brains working on circular economy, eradicating waste from our systems, why can't we eradicate poverty at the same time using that circular thinking method that I'm, I've just mentioned, that, those feedback loops? It's possible, it's doable, and it's preferable, as NASA is just us saying. How can we do that? Well, circular economy is the management of stock, quality of stock, amount of stock, and flows of energy. This is, these are the two things that we measure in circular economy. We understand how much stock we have of resources and how can we grasp energies uh, flowing into our markets or on our planet. So we understand the level of our stock in the biosphere, in the green part. We understand the level of our material stock in the technosphere. But there is a third stock. When I look at the planet, I see a third stock. I see a third stock of resource and energy. You and me, we are a stock of resources, we are matter, we are energy. And guess what? We are the, 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 the growing stock. We are the only stock that is growing. We are 7.5 billion and we are moving to 11 billion. The French ambassador just mentioned the dramatic growth of population, but if we look at this social dimension which is missing today in the circular economy 1.0 model. And if we look at this graph, we say, why can't we be innovative? Why can't we use that stock? Why can't we see that stock as, as abundant resources and endless energies that we can, we can potentially use in a clever way? And then we could measure all these stocks and understand whether I can use my natural stock, my human stock, or my technical stock according to my priorities in my market. We don't have to use the human sphere in each and every circular project. So how about inserting a human sphere in the uh, butterfly diagram to maybe have a more comprehensive uh, perspective of what stocks are available to me? As I said, we don't have to use all the stocks, but it's there. We are energy. We are there, we are a stock that is available at low temperature, at natural temperature. We are there, whether you use us or not. But it's not about using us as in the early 20th century in the Fordism uh, supply chain. It's about using us in clever way, maybe with universal uh, incomes, maybe as, as, as new, way, new inventive ways to see that stock of humans. The relation with the biosphere in green here, we consider ourselves as nature. 
We are nature. So there are four strategies, and the strategies between the human sphere and the biosphere is to say, can we develop a strategy of adaptation? Can we, like the ants, the ants wait more than all humans on the planet. Every day they are rebuilding the ecosystem. Can we, as nature, rebuild our own ecosystems instead of destroying it? There could be different adaptation strategies, like collective strategies to reforest or afforest an area. But it could be other strategies, like replacing environmental functions. And we will see an example in the next slide. It's possible. There could be other strategies of adaptation that are more scientific, and we need to learn from, from those scientists to understand how to adapt and to how human behavior could rebuild the biosphere. The strategy of evolution, the feedback loop from the biosphere into the human sphere, is about understanding from the scientist the evolutionary past of our path of our ecosystems. We just learned that every day or every week we have climatic uh, drama. Uh, how can we evolve and how can we understand better those feedback loops from the life? The link from the biosphere into the human sphere is the life link. How can we understand this evolutionary path and, uh, and adapt to it? In blue, it's us as endless energy. We are endless energy once we sleep and we eat. We can fix, we can repair, we can, we can remanufacture goods in our economy. In an economy of 11 billion people, is it wise to just rely on robots? Whereby we already know that we are missing resources from the ground at 7.5 billion. Question mark. But I'm not saying we should go back to the old good days. I'm saying let's be innovative and let's see ourselves as endless energy and, and as preferred energy because we are available energy. And then the advancement strategy, the advancement square, is a new way of measuring humanity progress towards our own survival. And this advancement is about three things. It's about how much well-being are we reaching out to well-being for all? Are we adapting enough in, under our strategy of adaptation with the biosphere? And how, are we valorizing enough materials so that we, feed, we provide materials to, to all human beings? And then we, have, we could have two new, uh, two new uh, business models, which, which are based on regenerative activities and restorative jobs. We could provide endless jobs and activities for all. It depends on how we want to reward those activities. But like, like I was saying before in the natural ecosystem, we could, each of us could have a role to play to rebuild uh, this messed up ecosystem. Few examples here. In Ghana, it's not about the, the, obviously the working conditions because they are not acceptable from a European point of view, but it's more about learning from those markets that understand what scarce resources are. In Ghana, since the 70s, 60s, uh, there hasn't been parts for, to fix cars on the road of Accra. Humans, human energies have been there to fix those cars. It's like in Cuba. So when, when you are scarce in terms of material resources, humans are there as energy to fix uh, the system. Replacing environmental function. In China, in the, the, the uh, Sichuan, uh, the Mayoxan ladies in China, in Sichuan region, they have been replacing the missing bees to, f to hand pollinate fruit trees. Otherwise, there's no fruits. The bees have been missing. So until such time the bees are coming back, the humans are replacing environmental function. Why can't we do that? Human assisting robots in Germany. Mercedes S-Class factory in south of Germany have been reintroducing humans because there were too many customizations and the robots couldn't keep up. In Sweden, you most probably know that they've dropped VAT uh, taxes from 25% to 12% on businesses, uh, repair-based businesses, to repair materials. Elon Musk, back in April 2018, sorry, uh, just announced that humans were underrated in his Tesla factory, and he missed the Tesla 3 model uh, deadlines because he was just relying on robots, which were not versatile enough. In, in, the, in the Netherlands, but it was also a, a project in France, people are now paid to cycle. They paid 60 euros because they are, they are not using their car 
and instead they use their, their bike. They are paying 60 euro to avoid all the related cost of having cars on the road. But it could, it could be, they could be paid double because um, I guess the related costs are far higher than 60 euro per month. But when we look at these examples from European markets, in Germany, how about taxing scarce resources? Cars are made of rare earth metal, which are a monopoly of China. And how much time until do we have until the shops while cycling in front of them? So to make sure inequality is, is part of the circular economy, we have these first three principles that I would call the safe uh, principles, with the third one which is a bit tweaked because it's about all externalities, including social externalities. Um, I would add three more principles, which I would call the just principle, the just space for humanity principle. Equality makes business sense. Like I said in, in, the, in the Spirit Level book, we explained that an unequal world is not good for business. So it's about versatility here. A just principle about developing financial ability as a priority. It's about affordability. An economy where I have to buy my phone, I have to buy my TV, I have to buy my car to access it, is obviously an economy creating barriers, and it's obviously not absorbing the last billion people at the poverty level, at the poverty line. An economy of service where I can access what I need when I need it, it could, could be very much affordable, but we need to embed this principle into the economy to ensure it's happening. And last principle, the just principle of using manpower, is innovative because it's available. It's there at low temperature. It's, uh, manpower is available. It's just a matter of deciding whether we want to use it or not in our circular project. Lastly, the top of the human sphere is about measurement, is about understanding the strategy of evolution. How much uh, do, we, do we know from it and how can we adapt to that strategy of evolution? And the strategy of advancement, whereby we will measure progress of humanity. And this is a proposal here to have a kind of dashboard for every country or every company or every government or NGOs with 10 outcomes now that, uh, that is embedded with the uh, human sphere in the middle, whereby we, uh, we measure this outcome to ensure that we reach regenerated land, we reach better health for all, we reach improved human development for all, at the same time as preserving resources. So we create an equal world. Last, last slide. This is the, 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 the latest version of the circular uh, human sphere. And the fact to have a, a human sphere at the center of the, the, the butterfly graph displays the topic from creating a world with material circularity uh, uh, as, a, as an objective, from creating a world where we address human needs thanks to circular economy, thanks to material circularity. So material circularity is no longer a mean to an end. It's, it's a mean to an end, sorry. The end objective being addressing human needs. So the first priority here uh, at the center of this slide is addressing human needs thanks to material circularity. The second priority is designing not only waste, but poverty out of our economic systems and our ecosyst human ecosystems thanks to the circular thinking, thanks to these feedback loops that we create uh, to embed as, much, as many people as possible and to preserve as many resources as possible. And the last priority, the final world, is that like any economic revolution, we might go to a consumption rebound. And that's a critical topic. Okay? We hide ourselves from that consumption rebound, but that might be a reality. The only solution that I foresee here, and we can debate it, I'm open to discussion, is what I call the collective decentration. Not deciding as an individual, not deciding as a collective individual, but deciding as if we were the next two, three or four generation of humans being to come. So decentration comes from the Iroquois law in uh, the Indian tribes in North America, and they are able to decide on their survival because they don't decide for themselves, they decide for the two or three next generation. 
How can blockchain, how can these new technologies make sure that every decision we take at governmental level and at corporate level is based on decentration? I don't decide for myself, I don't decide for my people, I decide for the people who are not born yet. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much for a very inspiring food for thought. And I'm sure that you have many questions, and I would invite you to keep them in mind and uh, to please ask them uh, to Mr. Lemin when he will be in the in the panel um, after the panel discussions, open to questions as well. So now it's time to uh, go to the first panel discussion. And I would like to introduce you uh, to uh, Tia Nurmilakso, and I've tried my best to do the name the right way. Very good. And uh, she is a journalist at uh, Ulle, and she will be the moderator for the first panel discussion, which, uh, we, uh, which will be on research and innovation on circular economy, challenges and perspective. Tia, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, welcome uh, to this um, first panel discussion. I'd like to um, introduce you to the panelists one by one. So first off is Kari Herlevi, who is Circular Economy Project Director from Citra. Welcome. And then uh, Riina Antikainen, director from Program for Sustainable Circular Economy from Finnish Environment Institute, SUKE. Uh, third panelist is Andre Mier, uh, co-ordinator of the Decisive European Project, IRSTEA. Welcome. And last but not least, our first keynote speaker, Alexander Lemille. And uh, before we start this revolutionary uh, discussion, I'd like to um, ask for our panelists to, to say a few opening words. And we can start with Kari Herlevi. So a couple of words about uh, from my side. Uh, I was given this um, topic, and of course it's very broad, but uh, maybe just a couple overlining themes here. Of course, we all know that uh, we can continue this path of linear model, and it was quite clear already before from the other presentations, but uh, it's good to stress that uh, circular economy is one of the tools. And But we heard from Alex, great presentation, by the way, what else we have to think about when you think about the uh, circular economy point of views. And uh, from our side, from Citra side, uh, we started our work uh, by doing the research of the wastefulness of the European societies. And, and, and uh, as was mentioned already by, uh, by the ambassador, the, the population growth will lead to the situation that uh, we have to fix this uh, uh, dilemma. And, and of course, humans are very much in the center of the topic. And uh, 
As mentioned also was that this really is not about just the material cycles, it's, it's about the inefficiencies in the system in a more general level as, as well. And also how to embed the social aspects, but also the kind of uh, SDGs, sustainable development goals, and um, uh, biodiversity losses, and of course, to, to how to battle the climate change. So all the, of these have to be in the same discussions when we think about the, the solutions. Um, the one one um, study I just wanted to ma mention here is the study made by CITRA and uh, European Climate Foundation and Swedish consultancy for material economics. It's really about uh, how circular economy can be a solution to, to mitigate climate change. And uh, in the study, uh, four materials were studied, uh, plastic, aluminum, steel, and, and cement. And already with uh, better high value recycling, material efficiency, and, and new business models like sharing economy, etc. you could actually mitigate the uh, European uh, industry's emissions more than 50%. So it's a very relevant study uh, from the European perspective. I know that this is very international audience today, so I just wanted to highlight a little bit about the circular economy outlook, uh, how we see at Citra, and uh, of course it's still very much a European concept uh, Finland, uh, Netherlands, France, nowadays Germany is doing a roadmap. But there are also many other countries who are looking into the space, and uh, Alex mentioned Uruguay uh, from South America, Canada, of course, from North America is, is uh, very much looking into this, and of course, Ch uh, Japan and China. In, in Africa, I would mention maybe Morocco from my own experience as, as well. So I think uh, it's still a European concept, but it is expanding quite rapidly. Then about the kind of system level changes, as I mentioned, we need to have all these on board and, and that's why it makes it very challenging to, to solve. And, and citizens is, uh, are not by accident in the centre. We are those who actually can fix these problems. Uh, from the Finnish roadmap, we are actually updating the roadmap as we speak and it will be published uh, next year, early, early next year. And there we will try to tackle circular economy and the linkages between climate change and uh, biodiversity as, as an example. And I think Alex, Alex brought very good ideas also to our roadmap work, how to integrate the kind of social aspects much better. But I will show some examples how we have been so far doing with that respect. I also wanted to highlight the role of businesses, as, as we know that uh, many investors are currently also demanding that uh, companies have a kind of long-standing strategy, how to solve the sustainability aspects. It's kind of a license to operate question for many companies. And uh, from our perspective, we have raised the circular economy most interesting company list from Finland, around 100 companies uh, from these different uh, business categories. And we have gone beyond that as well. We have also introduced a circular economy playbook for companies in, in September. And it, it will showcase practical tools for companies, how to do businesses in a circular fashion. So these two examples are quite good to kind of uh, push uh, industries forward. Then about the social uh, and human aspect, uh, uh, it's actually the backbone of the Finnish roadmap. So we are building the uh, circular economy natives for Finland uh, as we speak. We have built on the Finnish education system and integrated circular economy from kindergarten level to, to universities uh, in, in the kind of uh, studies. And already this year, almost 75,000 students, 1,800 uh, teachers are are doing the work and, and uh, for example, in the sixth grade, 75% of the students are learning about circular economy, also my <coughs> daughter. So it's really exciting times and, and of course we need to have that kind of competencies built in the society that we can actually transform Finland towards circular economy. I just wanted to lastly mention, Japan was already mentioned in Mari's uh, speech, and uh, I think uh, it's excellent time to kind of build on international collaboration. Uh, it has been challenging in many other areas, but I think in the circular economy space, it's a great opportunity still to, to build on kind of global solutions. Thank you.
thank you, Kari. And next, it's uh, Riina Antikainen, Director uh, on Program for Sustainable Circular Economy in SUKE, Finnish Environment Institute. Sorry, some technical, <laughs> too many things here. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear all. It's very my pleasure to be here and talk today uh, about the challenges and success factors and uh, some barriers also. Um, we heard already a lot of the challenges and also the benefits uh, the circular economy uh, can bring. According to the United Nations Environmental Programme, uh, the uh, world material extraction has already uh, has eightfolded uh, during the last hundred years, and uh, a recent study also shows that the world circular, uh, the world's economy is only about 9% uh, circular. There are those great benefits for, for example, synergies uh, for the uh, raw material use and uh, climate change. We, I'm also very happy and inspired to hear the previous presentations on those human aspects. Those have been highlighted uh, uh, also in connection to the circular economy, but why we are not, why the world economy is not more circular than this 9%. We made a, a study uh, some years ago with, uh, on European context on how the green economy and circular economy cases can be implemented uh, and what are the success factors and lessons learned from, from these uh, cases. Uh, we conducted this study in Finland, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, and then we have had also one partner from France, and I'm very happy to say that we have this established uh, collaboration, uh, research collaboration in, in France. Uh, we, well, we had those 10 cases, and from those we were able to identify different types of uh, factors where, that were very uh, common to all those cases, even though they were very different, uh, some were more related to uh, agriculture, some were more related to energy issues, uh, some were waste issues, and so on, but uh, these uh, factors are very uh, typical for all of them. Uh, we uh, classified them as economic and market factors, technical and research and uh, development factors, policy and uh, regulation, then the networks, social capital and public perception were very much highlighted in those both of success factors and also barriers. So it's actually the humans who are doing this. And I'm very happy that this came already in many presentations and speeches here. So something about the success and barriers for economic and market well of course if there are many uh, win-win solutions for example for economy for uh, the local uh, uh, and also national level uh, market there are these are some kind of win-win situations but often there is not funding for example after the pilot phase so these good initiatives stop after the kind of preliminary phase. There is not so uh, to, uh, enough sub support to make them an, uh, uh, in concrete actions and upscale. Of course, there are also those technical issues, but those were not so so. Uh, 
so much emphasized. Humans can find develop different types of uh, technologies, and there are already abundant amount of different types of technologies for, to implement the circular economy. Policy and regulations. There can be uh, regulatory pushes, uh, incentives. For example, one example from the uh, energy field is the bio biofuel uh, regulations. So when there was this mandate, so th then the biofuels were much more on the market. But there can be also regulatory uh, barriers. Uh, some uh, laws, for example, that uh, that uh, make some things impossible in practice. Also, uh, changing policies, so that policies change too rapidly, so that the, the uh, businesses cannot accommodate is uh, one important barrier. Then I already mentioned the networks and social capital. It's very important that the people can talk together, they, uh, they have the social capital, there is a leadership, there is a good management uh, in, in these when the actions are put into practice. Uh, in these new, maybe a little bit difficult, and also these uh, systematic changes, uh, uh, some kind of intermediaries are often needed. Existing uh, operators often want to maintain their, their businesses and current models of operating, and these intermediaries can initiate uh, some uh, novel discussions and introduce uh, different actors, novel type of actors to each other. But if there is lack of leadership or there can be also disciplinary, disciplinary differences so that people cannot kind of find each other and uh, the actions doesn't realize. Uh, public perception, the consumers, as we are already mentioned, the citizens <coughs> are also very important in, in uh, implementing the circular economy in practice. If we, as consumers, do not take and use these uh, business models or the pu public services provided that are, are uh, created at, according to circular economy principles, they are not uh, implemented. So these are my kind of uh, thoughts to start the discussion. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rina. And next, it's André Mier. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to present here today. And um, my presentation will be perhaps a bit different because uh, I'm a researcher, and I will present um, the progress of a European project, a decisive project, and how it can uh, give a solution, a type of solution for a circular economy. So I won't be long on the context because we have already heard about problem of urbanization, waste production, bio-waste, especially in this waste production. Uh, waste uh, issues means collection and valorization uh, questions and also prevention with this uh, zero waste uh, new policy. So we have nowadays a big pressure, especially in urban areas, urban territories, because of this urbanization and this waste production. But we have also value in waste. And uh, to <coughs> uh, keep 
this value, to get this value, we have to develop new models, new models that will um, link some benefits and some prevention of waste. And it's not so uh, simple. So in the decisive project, we are dealing with urban organic waste, the bio-waste, and we are proposing a new paradigm of management of this bio-waste. Uh, in the current way of thinking, there is a linear uh, management of waste, of organic and of energy in the urban territories. Food and energy is coming from outside and by waste is going outside. And what we want to propose is to insert some uh, circularity in this uh, urban territory by uh, valorizing by waste uh, as close as possible to the producers and also um, <coughs> using the products on, from this valorization to uh, close the loop of organic in the urban territory. So the project has begun two years ago and uh, will <coughs> continue two years uh, more and we hope to develop different uh, solutions um, first uh, I will focus on the impact that we want with such a new uh, paradigm. We want to develop, yes, circular economy, but circular economy at the same time with waste prevention, energy, uh, renewable energy production, and a new way of thinking, perhaps a new way of uh, inserting in urban planning the, the waste uh, management. So what are the proposed innovation of the project? First, an, an organizational innovation. Uh, it's not easy to go from a completely centralized uh, way of managed by waste to a decentralized one. And what we want to uh, propose is a solution to plan this decentralized network uh, of by waste uh, management. To manage this by waste, we need Technic, te technologies, excuse me. And we focus on uh, micro anaerobic digestion, that is to say, very little scale anaerobic digestion to produce uh, energy, but also agronomic product. And this agronomic product will be um, optimized with uh, solid state fermentation. And the other innovations we hope from the project are policy and economic uh, guidelines, because we hope that from this project we will obtain results that can um, give advices about uh, uh, policy advancements, but also economic policies. So, uh, why is it an opportunity for circular and local economy? Because decentralization of bio waste will offer new services. There will be some need for diagnosis for waste management. There will be some needed for a new way of collecting uh, the waste. There will be some new processes to supply. And there is a direct link with urban and or peri-urban agriculture and food delivery. And with all this topic, there are linked jobs. So I will go very rapidly on the project progress. At, at this stage, we have developed a decision support tool that will be um, <coughs> soon online that uh, can help um, municipalities to, to see how they can change their system and what will be the result of changing their system. And we also uh, provide a special optimization uh, tool that can help to place on a territory the best point for the treatment site, the valorization point. But the most important is coming because the most important is demonstration. We will have in the project two demonstrations, one in France near uh, Lyon, <coughs> where uh, a urban farm will, uh, will be the treatment site, the valorization site of bio-waste coming from surrounding restaurants. 
They will treat the bio waste. They will use the energy and the product, the agronomical product coming from uh, the bio waste. And they will use it to grow plants or vegetables that they will sell to the restaurants producing the waste. So we will, we, we hope to uh, <coughs> close the loop of organic on a little territory. And we will have the same type of uh, demonstration near Barcelona on a university campus. So, as Rina said, uh, there are some <coughs> some um, uh, opportunities, but there are also some barriers or limits to uh, such uh, initiatives. And what we are already uh, seeing, these are some regulations barriers, because a regulation is made currently for the current system and not for an innovative system. So uh, if we want the, it to success, we, we will have to change a bit the regulation, probably. Um, there is a question about energy retribution because uh, this system is based on energy. But uh, the main <coughs> thing to, to think about are responsibilities and competencies. Today, especially in France, municipalities are responsible for bio-waste. With a decentralized system, who is the responsible? Still the municipalities? How are the citizens uh, involved in, in the system? How are the private uh, producers involved in the system? This is a new model to invent. So you can find all the uh, progress of the project on this uh, website. There is also a newsletter information. And I hope that at the end of the project we will Yes, have a success or give some advice from, for a new uh, circular uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you, André Mille. Uh, the fourth uh, panelist is Alexandre Lemille, but since he already gave us the keynote speech, he <laughs> won't be presenting uh, any uh, starting words. Um, what a topic we have at hand. Um, the topic is um, research and innovation on circular economy challenges and perspectives. And I'd love to start with the perspectives because um, uh, it's so promising, uh, the perspectives. If we start with Kari Herlevi, you, you mentioned that um, uh, what we have at hand is, is a climate solution that even the IPCC missed, right? It is correct. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> one of the key solutions could be... Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's true. So circular economy could provide uh, solutions, and uh, I think it can, kind of is evident if we can uh, circulate materials and keep the value in the system. We don't need to, you know, mine new materials that much or use energy to produce those products th that much. So, so that's something that the research and innovation community should research more and uh, provide scientific evidence of that. And of course, the report I showed is kind of a uh, trailblazer in that sense, but it, you, we need to have more academic research on that, since it's a huge topic, as, as you mentioned. Yeah, and uh, on top of that, as well as easing the climate change, um, it could address inequalities in the world, as Alex mentioned. mentioned. So it's, my God, we, we really have a big solution at hand. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the point is to say that, uh, yeah, inequality is as, as big of a challenge as, as the resource mismanagement. And, we we often address issues in silo, whereas we should address issues from a systemic viewpoint. 
And uh, by addressing issues in silos, we still think linearly into cir circular solutions. So we need to start erasing our linear brain and start thinking in a circular model, whereby we have all these energies and e all these resources at hand. So what can we take uh, from them and what kind of advantages can we take from them? And if you start playing with tax regimes and uh, in circular economy, we tax what is scarce and we untax what is available at hand. Okay, so it's about time. Uh, Anne was just mentioning that she's got issues in laws and regulation in our project, but that's true in every, every single laws that we have today. And uh, it's about time to change those laws in order to, to become innovative and to come up with uh, amazing solutions. I mean, John D. Liu, uh, an American Chinese researcher uh, as a, uh, and permaculture expert, has proven to us that in Jordan, in Ethiopia, and in China, he has been rebuilding large landscapes, from moving from desert to jungles, to tropical forest, recreating f rivers, rebuilding uh, ecosystems in dry uh, mountains in Jordan. So it's possible. Human can re rebuild large ecosystems. Uh, one of the university in south of France is looking at how to use human air to do textile, to do the next textile matter. Why not? Obviously, we need to make sure that this is not a, the wrong business model, but why not? These matter, we are circular systems. The missing nitrate and phosphate is here. So how can we collect it to regenerate our soils? There is Sanergy in, in Kenya, which is a franchise business, whereby they pay people to go to the loo. They collect the produce of the loo and they regenerate the soils next door. They provide food to the people and energy to the people. And it's near Canberra, so it's uh, at the same time it, they address poor, poor people uh, situation. So solutions are there. I'm not saying we need to use humans at, in each and every circular project, but we just, it's a dashboard. We have three stocks. Let's play with them. Uh, I really love the opening words from um, Permanent Secretary Hannele Pokka, who, who said that we have to think in a revolutionary way. I think uh, this is really at the heart of that, that um, idea. And I like, I like this idea that we have to change our brains from the linear to circular. So let's try and do that in this panel discussion. Um, yes, we have these huge perspectives, but at the same time, we have huge challenges. Like Kari mentioned, uh, in today's Europe, we throw away about 80% of consumer products after one use. And on average, all the materials in Europe are used only once. So, Rina. Uh, you, you can keep the mic. Um, in your opening words, you were talking about the challenges or barriers to, to this huge um, change that we could be facing. So what is stopping us? Why aren't we going full speed? Yes, I already mentioned some of those problems. But I, I really think that it's mainly us humans. We have... We have heard, we have the solutions, we have, we have the technologies. We, we, the humans, we can change the laws, we can change the financing mechanisms, but it's, uh, it's very much up to the uh, thing that we want to keep that we have achieved. It's, it's me, it's you, it's everybody, and it's also the companies and it's uh, the na nations. So it's very difficult to give away what you have already achieved. And I think that that is the kind of the deepest thing behind there. Of course, uh, yes, uh, that, that, that's not an easy question to tackle, but uh, maybe by 
starting to do these things and experimenting different types of uh, things, they can start. We can start from uh, little ones and then upscale to move and move uh, to bigger ones, and also naturally uh, learning from doing is. Uh, uh, Essential ele element of experimentation. So I, I, I would maybe somehow like to bring some this kind of experimentation culture also to the circular economy uh, issue. Okay, uh, that's a good um, good place to go to Antremier. Uh, you have been working uh, with uh, urban bio waste, and you have been really. Experimenting with uh, trying to shift from this urban grey box, like you 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 say, uh, that implies that goods go in and waste goes out to to a more circular model. Uh, through your experience and your experiments, uh, do you think circular economy is achievable? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, I think there are different points of view. <laughs> From a technical point of view, yes, it is achievable, no problem. From a social point of view, I think there are different levels. Uh, majority of citizens are ready, I think, to change things. But are they ready to change it in their garden? I'm not sure. Um, another level is the governance, the communities, the municipalities. Um, how can they deal with these uh, changes? So um, these are issues much more complex than technical issues. But what we are um, um, seeing within this project and within a uh, uh, former project is that there are lots of uh, isolated initiatives uh, from citizens, from associations. But what we need now is to organize a more collective decentration, <laughs> yes? <laughs> Uh, and it's exactly what we want when we when we are talking about decentralization. It's not decentralization to say, oh, okay, uh, keep alone with your waste. No, it's okay. Valorize locally, but organize globally. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to the fifth speaker of our panel, and that's you. So if anyone has questions, just raise your hand. We are ready for them. Hi, um, thank you all for your uh, presentations. My name is Idil, I'm a professor of sustainable design at Aalto University. And my question is, I think for all of you, um, this all sounds great, uh, but also a little bit uh, techno and business centric. Um, and uh, Kari, you talked about throw awayism, and it's essentially a cultural issue. And Throw away awayism or consumerism is necessary uh, to 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 reaffirm and, and maintain um, our current political economic system. So I'm wondering if maybe we are moving towards a time when it's necessary to talk about circular economy in more political terms rather than uh, rather than keeping it as a question of getting rid of um, waste and poverty, because in order to get rid of waste and poverty, it's not only closing the loops or recycling, it's also changing mindsets, it's changing what we understand about the role of business in society, uh, which also goes back to, of course, how our economic, political economic system is structured and what it is 
producing uh, in terms of patterns and structures? I know this is not an easy question, but I just wanted to put it on the table. Thank you. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were mentioned in yes, the question. Yes, I know, I know. Yeah, it, it's true, it's really, uh, I think it's a combination, as I mentioned, about the kind of uh, citizen level, kind of uh, interest and uh, activism as, as well, I could put, but also you, it's not that you could actually do a great job in a circular economy just by doing yourself the things that you see relevant. It's very important, but you have to have the system, systemic change there as, as well. And uh, it's true, it's uh, not only about recycling and, and for sure at Citra we have been focusing more on the kind of uh, uh, systemic level changes and uh, transportation as, as an example where of course uh, globally I've been living in, in California and also to China to some extent we know that uh, you just can't continue uh, kind of uh, operating as an as individual level or in the governmental level as, as we have so far and we really have to design the system so that uh, actually you get the benefit what you are looking for for example in transportation from getting from A to B but you don't need for example to own a vehicle yourself but you actually get the service and I think the current system is not really ready for it and I think uh, one of the reasons is that there is not uh, enough um, know-how and understanding even though I think many of the technical things are there but we need to have the political will to kind of uh, be ready to implement and, and, and test those ideas as we are talking about the innovation side here so we have to just show that it's possible that we can actually really change how we operate at the moment. Okay. Uh, I would like to continue from this. Uh, there really is a lot of political support, uh, at least in, in discussion, uh, for the circular economy. So the European Union has launched its, uh, circular, its circular economic uh, package, and this, this package was kind of very uh, kick off for this uh, wider uh, discussion. And also the Finnish government is uh, doing a lot for, uh, to promote circular economy. For example, the, <coughs> the uh, Palastics roadmap was uh, published just two weeks ago. Uh, but I, I know that the political agenda is maybe a slow, quite slow, and sometimes uh, those businesses are very much more uh, agile to adjust their models. Uh, and that's why maybe sometimes this uh, discussion is also about businesses and consumers quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to continue for, from that in, in a sense. Uh, one of the key principles of circular economy is, that, is the idea that closing material and product loops will prevent primary production. But there was a recent research uh, saying that circular economy activities can actually increase overall production if uh, materials are uh, used more efficiently, the products become cheaper and therefore more appealing. So there, there is a, yet another challenge. Um, there was no question really, but <laughs> we could elaborate from that. Yes, um, primary production could, could, could decrease or like some are saying, uh, companies <laughs> will keep on focusing on primary production until such time uh, they have to go into a real circular economy and there is no, no other choice. And that's what we tend to see on the market, unfortunately, is that companies claim to be uh, joining the circular m movement globally, but they are still taking very much advantage of the linear economy until it dies. And, uh, they are not the first one to make sure that the linear economy disappear, unfortunately. So that's the reality of what's happening and uh, beyond the, the announcement that we see, unfortunately. Um, 
it will uh, it will also lead to maybe more uh, production because because services will be uh, could be cheaper i mean that's what i i try to explain in in designing an economy that works for all and it's possible it's just our limitations that make us believe that it's not possible it's just uh, it's not just utopian it's uh, when you look at systems, we can create a new mod the next model uh, by making sure that we provide enough for everybody on the planet. We can, we can do it. Uh, it's just a matter of willingness. Now, will it increase uh, production and consumption? Question mark. But from uh, all the past revolution, it has always increased the production and consumption. That's why. Um, <coughs> To address the issue of greed, to address the issue of how much is enough, uh, is not an, uh, an easy issue. And circular economy in itself doesn't address that issue. So that's why uh, we cannot take decisions ourselves. We are not responsible enough <laughs> for our own survival. We cannot take decisions collectively because we don't understand what's coming up next to, to us. I mean, the, the French ambassador just explained that we have climate change issues nearly every week, nearly every day. But we've been saying that for so many years. 1972, limits to growth. I mean, <laughs> until when are we going to wait and, and, and act? So uh, the question is that if we can't take decisions ourselves, if we, can't, if we can't take decisions collectively, then let's understand how we can take decisions for next generations to come. And there are some people successful, this is a full sociological new way of thinking, and they are experts in, in that. So let's understand how can we take business and governmental decision based on these principles. Yeah. Uh, in a way, I think one, one of the ideas is that, uh, or one of the questions is that uh, first, is it achievable, but then next, is it desirable? Uh, are we ready for this? And I mean, we are apparently we are not, but we should be for for the next generations. Sake, we, we, at least. I wish to believe this is desirable, okay? But not everybody agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to comment your uh, point you raised. So that's a kind of I think that's kind of classical rebound effect. So I, I, I changed my using my car to uh, using it public transport. I save money, but then I use my money to travel, uh, fly for holidays to Thailand or whatever place it is. So that there is a rebound effect. I don't actually reduce my consumption, but they increase it. But uh, that's why I think that it's very important to uh, really assess that what is the sustainable circular economy. It was already mentioned here that the transition and all the, these new uh, products, uh, services and systems need to be assessed from the life cycle perspective that we don't cause uh, more impacts environmental or other impacts uh, in, in Finland or Europe or other, uh, other places in the world. So that's very important to my mind. Yeah. Uh, do we have more questions uh, in the audience? Thank you. I'm Anne Metsilä. You, Alexandra Lemil, spoke at the example, we are nature, we are creating, we are building ecosystems, we are stocks, we can fix it. Your all people spoke at the same thing, but different worlds. My three quite small questions are, do you believe in you or we are gods? Don't you know all innovation are crimes in different level? Don't you know possibilities don't meaning that you or we have any right to do that, what we want or will to do? I'm not sure I, I understood all uh, three questions. Could you, could you repeat them, please? Uh, do you believe in you are God? <laughs> <laughs> the first 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a challenging one. If you can help me. <laughs> well, talking about gods, um, I truly believe that linear economy was born in the, during the first industrial revolution in an economy where people believed in uh, birth, uh, life, and death. Okay, that, that country was the uh, United Kingdom. We also believe the same, so it's not about criticizing United Kingdom. It's ju I'm just saying that if the first revolution was born in Thailand or in Nepal, maybe we would have been in a circular economy a long time ago. So I don't know about God, but I, I know that Buddhism seems to be attractive all of a sudden. About innovation as crime, uh, yes, if this is about, circular, uh, about uh, consumption rebound and if it's uh, worsening uh, the situation, but we tend to believe in circular economy that uh, innovation are here to address our needs and are here to create a better world. So it's all about uh, being willing to uh, to go for human development, to go for well-being, and to reach uh, beyond the sustainable development goals. So, if you believe that your innovations are net positive, uh, they shouldn't be uh, crime-related. The last question was. <laughs> So that if we have solutions, are we entitled to use them? I think that's the question. Where is moral? Where is moral? I guess, uh, yeah, it's up to each of us to develop uh, your own moral. Uh, I believe there are uh, collective awareness of what's going on. So, uh, like I was discussing the, during this morning, is that there's a choice. I mean, either we take the war path, which is full, full on competitive uh, markets where we fight, we fight for resources and we continue with this inequality uh, in the world. Or we choose the life uh, path. The life, the life path is about collective action. It's about cooperating. It's about accessing resources in a clever and collaborative way and granting access to resources to all of us uh, without thinking about any uh, wrongdoing. We have a choice. Right now, it seems that we take the, the war pass, the strategy of war, the, uh, the Sun Tzu, uh, Sun Tzu uh, strategy of competitions in business. Maybe we should take the other pass, but that's up to us to decide. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so um, just a quick question for all of you. Um, I really like the idea uh, that Alex gave us that um, circular economy was, in the heart of that was the idea that we want waste out, but now we want the po poverty out as well. And now I'd like to uh, ask all of you, uh, what are the concrete ways that could lead us to this huge change? And um, it's a huge question, and still I want s short answers. Uh, how do we cope with the challenges that we have ahead of us? Well, <laughs> I think uh, I, I actually believe in innovation, and that, that actually we can, uh, through the science and, and the evidence that it gives to ch change things. And I think when you think about, for example, smoking, at the time it was something that uh, it was done everywhere, but at, suddenly we got more and more evidence about it. And I think here we are talking about similar things that uh, we are fully aware of it, and we try to now tackle it, in, in, and especially innovation and collaboration are key. Mm. The change is possible. We, we used to think that it's okay to smoke cigarettes everywhere. Yeah, yeah it's a good, good.
good parallel. Yeah, yeah that's good. Very good. Uh, I would like to highlight the thing that I already mentioned, the experimentation culture and start doing. Sometimes it goes a bit wrong, but then you learn from it. And if you start by uh, doing from little things, then they can scale up and then uh, the uh, when you see other people doing things, you join and then. And uh, one thing that we, Finland and other European countries as well, is that we have these wonderful technologies and we can help uh, the poorer countries to use those, for example, uh, solar uh, technologies and so on. And sanitation. Yeah, we can help uh, poorest country, but we can also help poverty in our country. And uh, if we look at uh, waste valorization, it's an opportunity for a social inclusion also uh, with jobs, but also with a social relation linked to uh, waste valorization and closing uh, the loop. And for example, the question of um, uh, local collection of waste. Uh, you have some association today that are developing a uh, bicycle collection or so on that are really good opportunity for social inclusion and these example are already existing. Um, what I believe in is that technology alone will not save us. Uh, it could be a crime because technology increase pressure on on our systems uh, unless we're talking about dematerialization but dematerialization is also increasing uh, heat uh, in our polar poles uh, while uh, some people are hiding their servers there so technology alone will not be enough it's about all of us to act and we better start and we could start with the food systems because that's the the core center where the, the point one uh, where to start and um, I also believe that if we don't design the next economic model properly this time uh, we won't have another chance for uh, for for this mistake so we better create a circular economy which is equitable at the same time great the, this with this idea in mind uh, I thank you all panelists and I'm sorry that we had such a short time and I invite you to uh, uh, continue the conversation with these clever people this, this evening at the Institut Francais. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, it is now my pleasure uh, to introduce you to Beatrice Bellini, our second keynote speaker. Uh, Beatrice is an associate professor in management science at Paris Nanterre University Business School, and she is the director of the chair Positive Business Value for All, that aims to uh, spread research and teaching for more responsible organization. She is also managing the marketing MBA with specific module about product and envi environmental and social quality as new opportunity to create value. Beatrice, the floor is yours. Okay. Super. Uh, thank you, Gail, to invite me, and um, I'm very happy to be there because uh, I'm going to propose you a solution for all we discuss. <laughs> Great. So. Um, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, we talked that uh, we have to uh, to adopt uh, new models. Uh, we have no choice, and that's right. And uh, it's we are going to talk about um, business. So the solution will be uh, through the business. And we are going to talk about KPIs. Do you know what KPIs is? Key Performance Index indicators, 
and uh, that's uh, very important today uh, for the decision process. So uh, it's very important to, to, to have in mind these KPIs to organize a great evolution towards a circular economy. Um, I thank Srina because uh, she presents a very interesting story. Um, we saw that um, circular economy uh, isn't so profitable. Uh, there is no funding after a pilot project. Um, but if it's efficient, we don't need fund. So we explain how circular economy can be, can be efficient. And uh, she talked about the disciplinary difference because, you know, um, with the globalization, we have, we need a global view. So people from ecology, biodiversity, climatology, oceanography, technology, management, economy, lawyers, everybody have to talk to one with each other. Um, the problem is that we have not the same language. And for example, when I talked about performance, it is not understood uh, at the same way for a, a, a mechanism, uh, an engineer of a lower. So we have to discuss and we have to develop a common language. And the first word is we have to listen one with each other. It's very important. Um, so um, we have created in uh, Nanterre University a chair that, that names positive business value for all. And so I thank uh, uh, for the presentation just before because it's, uh, it's very uh, relevant. Um, so I don't see this one. No. So, um, we have to develop responsible business models to promote equality. And it's very important to have in mind that in all business models, we always learn, teach the same things, um, and we don't learn about circular economy business models. So. In 220 it's, uh, and 18, it's very um, important to take care about that. Because in marketing, we always teach to, s to sell more and more product. In finance, we always teach to choose uh, the most profitable uh, solution uh, with the only economical aspects. So it's very difficult, for example, for a financial director to choose a solution that promotes the social aspect, for example, if the solution is less economical um, efficient. So we have to change the model and we have to be careful because sometimes um, circular economy uh, is seen like waste management, you know? So it's a sort sometimes of greenwashing. Why? Because you stay in a linear economy, the objective remains to sell more and more products, and we, we say to people, hey, no problem, because after we take the, the waste and we are going to manage this waste. Uh, there is a problem, you know? Because when you produce more and more product, you have to take the resource, and sometimes you don't use the waste in the same circle to do the same product. And there is a big problem, because when you recycle films, f f waste, you need energy, you need water, and sometimes it is really not very, uh, the assessment are not very good, you know? So we have really, really to be careful. Um, we have to develop not a curative policy, but a preventive policy. What means that? Um, we have, in the first step, when we design product and service, to think about social and environmental impact. And it's very good for innovative solution, you know? Because in the design step, we define 80% of the impacts. Uh, the second point is about the decoupling growth from the raw material consumption. 
we see that after. And functional economy means sell the function and not the products is a key economy for that. And the, the last point is value creation thinking. You know in marketing, people don't learn about the environmental product quality or the social product quality. How can we create the value if we don't have uh, some teaching about that? So it's very difficult and we are going to see that the consumer is more and more sensitized, um, uh, so, um, is more and more want product, more and more, more social product, environmental product, but sometimes he don't know how to choose. So for marketing it's very easy for us, you know? We take a label and as nobody know what's behind this label, it's very uh, efficient to choose a good communication agency rather do things for the value chains of the product. So that's the fact now. And uh, this is um, uh, a typology of strategy, environmental, stra uh, global strategy, excuse me, corporate strategy, how the social responsibility is um, is, uh, is integrated in this strategy. And we, we can note that now circular economy is at level two. Curative impacts management, why? We produce more and more uh, products. You know, when uh, we try to sell um, every product, the objectives and the KPI is Always, uh, it is linked to the, 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 the number of products. For example, in, uh, in car factories, for Renault, French, French firm, uh, we have always this key performance. How many cars have we sell? So there is a real problem. So um, you saw that the product design in, is not efficient now. Why? Because as product design is managed by, by engineer, we don't include the business model approach. That is a really a problem. Um, so the level five is the functional economy. And functional economy is the basis of a good circular economy. I've I think that in France we have a definition of circular economy and functional economy is a part of it. I think it's really important to, to, to know the importance of this new function, functional economy. And you say that it's a lone solution that enable to be in the planet tomorrow. Uh, this is... Um, the explanation of uh, decoupling growth with uh, raw material consumption because we can't uh, stay in this uh, situation. And functional economy can enable to uh, decoupling this group, this growth to raw material consumption. Uh, we have to be careful. Um, of green or social was watching business model. Uh, I think that you, 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 you know some uh, uh, bicycle centuries. We, we have uh, some journalists that, that report, who report about these centuries in China. And at the beginning, it was a good idea. We propose people not to buy product, but only to buy the function. So what the problems here? It's because we don't really manage the environmental impact or social impact or something. Something in not good. And you know, sometimes these firms, at the beginning it was a startup. The, um, the firm is not profitable, but there is funding and financial people that give money and develop that. So there is really a problem sometimes of business model, of true business models. Um, integrating uh, environment and social. Uh, we have to use the new consumer expectation to create value. Uh, since one year now, the 
the consumer behavior has changed, and you know, the, the young people are very fond of this sort of products. And a lot of people are ready to pay more for this new product, for, for this citizen's product. So um, I work 20 years in eco-design department in an engineer school, and the objective of eco-design is to have less price, you know? So it's very good eco-design because you use less resource, so it costs less. But we never talked about creating value that an eco-design product must be a sell at a higher price. And it's very important to create value because the positioning, the marketing position is very different. When we talk to marketing management, manager, that we, we are going to create value, oh, it's a very, uh, uh, it's an impact. So we have to uh, use this consumer expectation. We have also to be careful to some, uh, we, we name fake industries. We, have, we are not going to save the world with electric cars. Everybody knows that. So we have to change and to talk about mobility and we talk to talk about intermobility, but it's very important to change the world that we used. Mobility is a function. Cell car is the uh, product. And sometimes um, we, some, some firms um, abuse or are not very fair with this position, with this marketing uh, approach. Uh, so uh, this is the analysis of uh, 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 an example of a model, business model concept. And uh, we see that for the moment in the consumer value proposition, we don't talk about environmental and social quality. And remember, uh, Rina said that there was a quality, quality issues. Yes, there is a quality issues. You know, when you assess a, a quality product, you don't integrate social and environmental quality. It has value, you know. And for example, for France, it's very important to integrate the social quality because, you know, we, pay, we have a specific model with lot and lot and lot of social advantage and things like that. So when we produce in France, we have to value that we have this social advantage. And you know, um, it's very important because it can, it can create value on the products. And why? Because when you analyze the position, it's less, the, the financial risk can be less when you better manage the social aspects. So it's very important, and it is linked to the reputational risk too. So it's very important to, 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 to better manage these propositions. And the value uh, architectures is very important too. You know, in March last year, we adopted a new law in France, a due diligence law. And uh, all French groups must uh, be responsible and uh, know the impact, the environmental impact and social impact for all the value chain, even if they have no contract with uh, the firms, with the suppliers. So it's, a, it, it's going to cost a lot. And if we don't sell our product at a higher price, there will, be a, there will be a problem of competition, okay? So if we want to remain with French, French firm tomorrow, we have to work about this new business model. Uh, the last uh, slide is about an example we have, dev we have developed in France, La Marque du Consommateur, because you know, um, uh, Three years, and f three years ago, the agricultural ministry asked people to propose a solution for the milk producer. We have a lot of milk produ producer in France, and so um, there are a lot of difficulty to survive, and they, they ask uh, some people to develop solution. And uh, we, we were the, one of them proposed la marque du consommateur. 
uh, they ask people to participate to s specifications of the products. And they were very surprised because people want social quality but also environmental quality. And you know, this milk has been sold 48% more than the, the, the basic milk, the first price, and it takes 1% of the market share in three months. It's a, a great success. So now they developed uh, the eggs, uh, meat, uh, and a lot of products, pizza, and things like that. And it's very interesting because it shows that people want other products, more citizen products, and they are ready to pay more. And for the specification of this milk, it's very important because, for example, uh, for each criteria, it explains how it costs. For example, the first question was, do you want that the farmer will, uh, is paid for his work? So every consumer said, yes, of course. And they saw that it was seven centimes more than the first price. Because at the first price, basic price, we don't pay the farmer enough for him to survive and to be. It was the same for, for example, for the cow to, to go outside and things like that. And they're ready to pay. So it's really possible. Uh, we develop also, uh, uh, our colleague from CITRA uh, uh, talked about the teaching. It's very important to teach with due decision tools, and we developed the business games, and uh, it enables people to be conscious of the economic profit, but no, the social profit and the environmental profit. And if he wants to increase his economic profit, he sees that sometimes the environmental profit is less or the social profit is less. And it's very important to see the link between the economic, the social and environmental, and to make more um, adapted and uh, responsible business uh, decision process. Uh, to conclude, uh, the circular economy uh, 2.0 uh, aims, uh, must aims to reduce inequalities in the con context of globalization. And I think that uh, we have to pay more attention to functional economy. I think that we pay more attention to the design of products eco-social design of product, you know it's very difficult. Eco-social design is design that includes social and environmental aspects. It's very difficult, why? Because the engineer takes care of the environment and social people take care of the, so of the social aspects. They don't discuss, they don't understand when we over. you know? It's very difficult. So we have to develop some new way of uh, teaching we do that with robots and things like that. We, we innovate, sometimes it's good, sometimes no, but uh, we try to innovate new way of teaching to make people discuss one with each other. And the last uh, point is about KPIs. We have to say, hey oh, stop now. We don't have the right KPIs to go to a more sustainable economy. And uh, there is a French scientist that said that political people are very important. So they have to be heroes. And we are here to be heroes for tomorrow life and we 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 have to 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 consider uh, that as consumer we can choose and for example if you want to buy clothes look when you ask the vendors hey it's made in bangladesh do you show sure it's good for social and uh, it's good social manage for example and if you 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 Ask the same peop the same question to the vendors. Obviously, it's it's sure that the vendors tell to his manager and after to and it's a very very uh, positive approach. So thank you very much.
Thank you. So this is time for the second panel discussion, and I would like to welcome our moderator for the second panel, which is Laura Manas, uh, Communications Manager at the Technology Academy of Finland. And this panel discussion will be on circular economy, companies, and territories. Welcome. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. So it's time for the second panel that is for um, about companies. So let's welcome our panelists. First, uh, Stefan Poirier from uh, he is a co-founder from Helsieni. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> And Kalle Saarima, Vice President from Recycling and Waste Solutions from Fortum. Welcome. <laughs> Tina Kähö, Executive Director of Helsinki Metropolia Smart and Clean Foundation. <laughs> Welcome. And Anne Kaiser, a Sustainability Manager from uh, saint Gobain, Finland. And then uh, our second keynote speaker, Beatrice Bellini. Welcome. So we have now heard a lot of good ways to make business more circular. However, we are normally overwhelmed with information about the world drowning in waste and pollution. We have even our seas full of plastic, even we found plastic in our tap water. So this first question is actually for all of you. I would like a brief answer from everyone. Do we and do the companies still have time to change the way we use nature's resources? Is this still realistic? Um, Beatrice Bellini from Paris Nanterre Business School, please, if you want to start. Sorry, we, 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 of course, we don't uh, start the panel discussion yet because we have our presentations. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. So you can now, yeah, you can think about the first question now. And uh, of course, it's time to welcome, sorry. <laughs> it's time to welcome Stefan Poirier from Helsieni. I'm sorry for the order mistake. <laughs> uh, I think. Thank you for inviting me here, and uh, hello everybody. Uh, it's hard to come after all these good ideas, and uh, I'm not so experienced in, in teaching, so I, but I, I'll try to, to still give some, some ideas and, and some things. Um, so I'm part of, of this company, a very local company you see on the map on the left that uh, we, are, we have our office in Helsinki Center and our mushroom farm in Vanta, which is uh, 20 kilometer north. So uh, we know the place here. <laughs> and uh, on the right, you see an uh, inside picture of uh, our uh, mushroom farm, which is actually, it's, it's a tiny mushroom farm now. It's only uh, two containers and a fridge, so like three containers, basically. Uh, but of course, it might get bigger or we might get other ones in other places. The, the goal is more to, to, to use, the, use the resource where it is rather than uh, have a hub uh, of mushrooms going in and out. But our uh, circular economy model is, is uh, you can see it here, where we collect coffee from restaurants. Uh, we grow uh, mushrooms from that coffee, which is full of, of available energy. Uh, and then we deliver the mushrooms to restaurants, sometimes the same ones, uh, not always, but we try. And, um, and we are going to add a second loop because uh, if everything goes fine next summer, we will have a small greenhouse uh, using our, um, our uh, compost uh, made from our spent substrate, like mushroom waste, basically, even if I'm 
as, as uh, some others said before me, I don't really like the, the word waste here, but... Um, and w uh, we also will use in the greenhouse the CO2 that the mushroom produce when they grow and uh, the heat that we have extra because we are not... We, we are too low-tech and too small to really efficiently recycle uh, the heat uh, because uh, heat exchangers are expensive. So we'd rather use the extra heat. Uh, it's actually cheaper to use it than to recycle it. Recycle it. Uh, here is a small view of our products. Uh, we, we sell workshops where people can come and learn the basics of, of uh, mushroom farming, or m let's say mushroom, uh, I don't know if it's farming for them, but at least how to cultivate mushrooms. Um, we sell uh, grow kits for the same purpose, but uh, people can order them at home and there is instructions on how to grow mushrooms from coffee, from your own coffee, of course. And we sell fresh mushrooms, uh, we sell mushroom dowels, it's kind of a different product, but uh, it, it allows uh, to grow mushrooms on logs. If you, have, if you are cutting your apple tree and you have extra wood and you don't have a wood oven, you can always grow mushrooms on them. And we are selling also part of our uh, output waste. Um, for people to grow mushrooms in their gardens because if that substrate gets uh, rainfall on it, then it's still able to produce uh, mushrooms. <laughs> there is uh, extra energy in it. It's only, it only requ requires water to produce more mushrooms. Um, I added this slide because uh, Nicolas Hulot, the former uh, French uh, Ministry for Environment, was invited to this conference. But as some of you, uh, well, he might not have come, uh, probably. But anyway, uh, as, as uh, some of you know, he resigned before even having a chance to come. Um, but it was for for me. He was the only. Uh, he was the, the main uh, guarantee that something would happen uh, in France, like strong, uh, strongly uh, about environment. So it was kind of a small shock, and I wanted to have to to put here some of the sentences he 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 said when he resigned. Uh, he had very clear and strong talk on the radio. Uh, and I, I, I also based my, uh, the next slides kind of on, uh, on, on, my, on my own thoughts and why we are doing this circular economy project, but also on, on what this, uh, uh, because one of his sentences uh, was that I did not put here, was that I hope that by resigning, I will change something. So I, I was thinking that maybe we should think of it. So uh, as it was already, this, this slide is kind of a, a concentrate of, of what has been said before me, um, that we, we kind of run out of time. It also <laughs> part of answers or it's, uh, uh, we, we run out of time, but uh, so what I put here, uh, we, we have to change things today, not tomorrow. Uh, yesterday is gone, so let's not think about it. But there is still uh, many mistakes that we, we uh, do, uh, and even, even like still officially and politically do. Uh, the first mistake, we don't do too much anymore. Uh, it's producing or using uh, irresponsible products in irresponsible ways. We still do a lot, but at least it's not anymore so politically politically correct. For example, the uh, one-use plastic bag or the one-use uh, plastic spoon or, or such things, or the, um, uh, how is it called? Um, the, uh, well, I forgot. The, anyway, uh, these, these products, they, uh, they are useless because uh, out, like you could replace 100 one-use bags by one reuse, reusable bag. Uh, and they are uh, made in irre irresponsible ways because they, they use resource. They they, uh, they are made from crude oil. Uh, they are pro this crude oil is processed, wasting energy. 
and in the end you have a bag which usually finish, finishes uh, in the ocean uh, killing animals. Um, so this is kind of already changing, but the two, the two next points are still to change. Uh, one is producing useless products in uh, responsible ways, like uh, one use uh, wood, spoon, uh, okay, it's made of wood, it will probably not kill animals, it will biodegrade. You did not have to extract cr crude oil, you can plant new trees instead of the one you, you had to cut, but actually you did not need to cut them because uh, you can just use a reusable spoon. And the, the, the third point is uh, useful products used uh, irresponsibly <coughs> and um, or produced irresponsibly. For example, a reusable plastic bag is still using crude oil. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and in food, there is lots of examples, like uh, meat production, like I put here a picture of chickens, which are uh, produced irresponsibly, and, and, and we are going to pay for that. And then we, the, the fourth point was already t talked a lot uh, about the the fact that we can also uh, know that we have to change things, but not change anything, and that's called greenwashing, and lots of companies do it. Uh, so the obstacles to, to uh, changing the, the model, uh, the first one is GDP-based policies, uh, because all, like basically producing all the products that I presented before, which are irresponsible or useless, increases the GDP. And GDP is the main indicator for a successful poli uh, policy nowadays. So by, by doing mistakes, which will lead us in disaster, we are uh, increasing the main indicator for a healthy pol uh, policy. Then there is the, uh, the patents, patents on life especially, but patents altogether. Uh, we believe at Helsinki, that's why I added open source in the title, we believe at, uh, uh, in collaboration rather than competition, because we have to go fast. Uh, and if the first one who did, we are not the first one to do what we do, and if the first one who had grown mushrooms and coffee had patented it, then we would, we would, we would all be stuck and uh, nothing would go on. And then uh, political action is sometimes slower than the, the people's minds, like for example, the European citizens were against TAFTA uh, uh, and CETA, and CETA is already gone through. Uh, so uh, we have to also maybe follow sometimes the opinions of, of people because they are kind of faster than politics. And uh, the CAP, uh, I think I'm running out of time, but this, this point I just wanted to mention uh, because we, we had some, um, some, some citizen gathering with the, uh, of one of, of, of this, this French ministry at the French embassy some months ago. And she said at some point that the, the main goal of the new CAP, the so common agricultural policy, uh, it, it was to, to push agriculture towards ecology and food independence. But then I look at those numbers down there, which shows in terms of water, the, is that the stop? So it's how much water you need to produce one kilo of, of food or 10 megajoules of food. 10 megajoules is what one, one adult human uses one day. <laughs> And, and, you, and then I was thinking that the CAP is nowadays subsidizing the, the cereals uh, and the cattle. So the cattle is subsidized twice because it eats mainly nowadays cereals or, or at least uh, field produced food. And our mushrooms is subsidized known because we don't have enough hectares and we don't have cattle heads. So uh, I don't think that, C and I don't think that CAP is nowadays and even the next one is not yet pushing towards ecology and food independence. Um, well, I, I have to, to, to leave the microphone, I'm, I'm a bit slow. Uh, but uh, more and more customers are ready, and I can say our customers have changed since we started. It's changing fast. Uh, politics start to talk about it, and what I said before, they talk, so they also have to move. Um, and uh, models are changing. We are not anymore fighting between is it technology or is it human values. I think we can do both. And, and Europe could be a leader because uh, the USA is going back, is going back to charcoal uh, economy and uh, China is still a bit uh, behind. So Europe has to be fast and can be a leader in it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Stefan Poirier. Now it's Kalle Saarima. Welcome. Thank you. From Fortum. So I, uh, we have set the pointer somewhere. Slide changing. Here. Yeah. So uh, uh, very nice to be here as well, uh, as well on from my behalf and. Uh, it's been very nice to hear very different viewpoints on circular economy, very different different angles, and it is a it is a complex. It's a it's a big and complex complex issue. Uh, I will talk about plastics today. So, uh, so what what is the role of plastics in the circular economy? Uh, I will also have some small side tracks, but I will be I will be brief brief, brief and uh, try to package the message and simplify a bit. Um, so where do we start from? Um, this is, this is no news, most of you, but we know that already in August we have spent the resources the plant can generate every year. And the only way to solve this is, is, uh, is that, that, that we are able to circulate the materials. Um, so it's recycling, prevention and business models. Um, if we go, uh, th this was presented by Citra already today, so in a way, Many people think that if we solve the energy transformation, so we move towards um, uh, renewable energy, or we solve the renewable energy, then we have solved uh, our um, climate change challenge. But, but that is not, not the case. So we need to also go through the material transformation, because um, even if we would do zero emission or, or CO2 neutral energy, the materials production in the world would still with a growing population would still contribute more to the CO2 emissions than, than the two degree Paris uh, agreement would, would, would need. So in a way, the material, re, material um, solution is needed for two things. First of all, overconsumption of, of the material. So we are growing a growing number of people, but also for the climate change. So material transformation is, is very important from the two, two, two of these point of views. Uh, I will go here first. So then, what's plastic? So what's plastic? It's, it's a superior material. Um, without, uh, if we look at what is plastic contributing to the, to the society, it is, uh, it is light material. Uh, uh, we have, when we've been able to put plastic to cars, for instance, the emissions of mobility has gone, gone down drastically. Or medicine, applications in medicine, how much we have saved lives because we have hygienic materials in, in, in hospitals. Um, there's also studies that show that if we would now replace plastics with other substitute, substitute materials, that would mean that our CO2 emissions of this material, which is one, one of the big CO2 contributors already, would, would uh, grow to fourfold. So fourfold more CO2 emissions if we would now just take a decision of getting rid of plastics. So the, my point is, point is here. I'm, am I lobbying here that plastic is only good thing? Uh, of, of course not. Uh, same time, we know that by 2020 there is more, pl more plastic in the ocean than fish. So, so this, is, this is complicated, actually. So if we kind of say that, hey, let's get rid of the plastics today, okay, there might not be then uh, uh, plastics in the ocean, but then we would totally miss our, our target for climate change. So my point, point here is that we can't kind of make simple solutions to very complex problems, which, which, for, which plastic is, is, is clearly one of those very complex problems. It has many, many, many benefits, uh, when used right and in right applications, but then it has many, many, many difficult downsides if it's if it's not used in a responsible way. So, so the point being, uh, it, it is not an uh, it's not an easy easy thing to solve. So where do we start from? I think um, um, Mrs. Bellini put a very good point on kind of a product design and and and. Uh, uh, circular economy starts a lot from, from the beginning. So currently, uh, if we look at um, how we have designed this society, on top of the uh, points mentioned earlier today, that the social uh, and environmental impacts are not maybe uh, seen in the, in the products as they should be, but at the same time, uh, products made from virgin materials, they are not paying for the total cost they are causing. So nobody is actually paying today 
the cost that that environmental is carrying. So now we are kind of generating debt for the uh, upcoming generations because these linear business models, nobody is really paying for the cost. So somehow we need to. There are different options. Uh, I, I tend to be. Uh, uh, working in a corporation, we try, try to be realistic quite often on the, at least on the short-term options. So, of course, we could say that, hey, now, now these linear products, they need to start paying the whole cost that, that, they, that they carry. Then immediately, actually, these repaired products, long-lasting products, or products made from recycled materials would be cheaper than these uh, uh, virgin, virgin made products, like most likely this jacket that I have is here. So that would be one option, but we would not be able to make a global commitment like that today. So then another option, for instance, in the European level, would be that we kind of uh, reduce the cost of recycled products because they are then, um, they are then promoting good in society. So they are kind of uh, uh, promoting for the social and environmental benefits and, and that would be a way to balance the, the cost difference between those. Then, of course, um, uh, we need um, technology development. Still, different, different ways of recycling materials. Are, are, uh, the technologies are very young still, because circular economy as a concept is young. Uh, there, for instance, in plastics, we can see that now we have today, in a way, one of the only, only good options for recycling plastics is mechanical recycling. In the future, for instance, chemical recycling could be, could be something. Then business models, naturally. This is something we've been discussing here today a lot already. But finding ways, new business models uh, that would fit in the, that, that would kind of, uh, it is consumer driven and the sustainability driven business models. Um, and then finally, kind of uh, the future, if these are the kind of uh, more next steps what I was just discussing about. In the end of the day, um, I believe that we have quite, quite bright future ahead of us. When we talk about recycling, it's, it's really only just elements, elements going around. And with metals, it's easy because they are already in an element, element model. Then if we talk about plastics, what are plastics? Those are hydrocarbons. We have carbon dioxide in, in our atmosphere in a hu two big amounts, huge amounts. Then at the same time, only in two hours time, all the energy that the world needs is, is, is reflected or is, is emitted from the sun to the, on the surface of the earth. So we don't have in the future energy problem. We have only problem when we use energy because renewables are not available at, the, at, at, at all of the times. But then when we have excessive amount of energy, and that time is not so far away in the future, and we have excess amount of hydrocarbons. So then we are not talking about anymore how we recycle, for instance, plastics. Then we are, then we are moving towards hydrocarbon recycling. So we have enough hydrocarbons that we all know, or carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and energy will be also um, uh, uh, not anymore scarce resource. Only it's about when you use energy. So then in the future, I think we have all the means and technologies to really solve this big issue. But now we need to concentrate on the next steps, which are still a little bit uh, more, more, more um, concrete than and for today. Thanks. Thank you, Kalle Saarima. Now it's time to welcome uh, Tina Kähö, for Executive Director of Met uh, Helsinki Metropolia Smart and Clean Foundation. There you go. Okay, good afternoon. Is everybody still awake? Yes, I guess so. It's, it's heading uh, to the closing time soon. But it has been such an interesting uh, afternoon. I'm really pleased and honored that I was invited to this event. And uh, uh, we've been talking about circular in economy in a so different ways. But I've been calculating how many times have you mentioned cities so far. And I haven't really found out that maybe once or twice, but not many times yet. But I try to kind of explain briefly our approach here in Helsinki or in Helsinki region, uh, how we are trying to tackle this very wicked problem or these very big challenges that we are facing. And as you can see in the, in the board, we are kind of talking about leading disruption. 
you might think that, okay, you can't say that disruption is something that happens so that uh, it was not ex expected and, and it's not uh, uh, possible to manage in, in any way. But we, we believe, as it has been said in so many times in, in today's uh, talk, that we are in the middle of a transition. Uh, we are in a transition towards circular cities, towards carbon neutral societies, but we have so many hinders um, on our way and we can have a lot of uh, rebound effects and uh, that are taken, taking us to a really wrong direction. For example, in transportation, we talk about autonomous vehicles. Are they going to solve this whole problem or not? It can be either way, I don't know. But we believe that we need to work together in a new ways. And Smart and Clean is a, is a community. It's a foundation that I'm leading for five years. We've been working for two years already, and we have uh, some three years to go. Uh, but it started from the business leaders here in Finland that are really forward-looking, uh, and they uh, were kind of pushing the cities here in the metropolitan area that we really should be the window to the world where we have all these best solutions that the global cities are tackling about. And so we started this project uh, two years ago, and this is what we are now aiming for. We want Helsinki to be the best testbed in the world for smart and clean solutions. How many of you believe that we can pull this off? Yes, I like that. You are so kind, <laughs> always. It's always the answer. But I think we have to. So also I have to answer Laura's question. Are we still, do we still have time? Are we able to do this? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. I can be a little bit pessimistic, but I think we just have to do it. We have to pull all the efforts that we have to be able to do this. But very quickly about test beds. Uh, we are very uh, much talking about business ecosystems, test beds, platform economy, aren't we? The digital transformation, uh, all these issues. And we always, uh, or we are not always talking about the same things. <clears throat> And with testbed, we are actually learning by doing that uh, this is not only piloting and testing something, but it really needs to find ways how to create public-private partnership models for people, really people-centered business models, people-centered solutions in the cities that we can scale up and really uh, use permanently. And this is very difficult. We are not there yet, but we are really working hard on this. Because what we are really aiming is the permanent changes that we all need. And I don't need to tell you these uh, targets that we all need to achieve. We are talking about mobility, we are talking about circular economy, we are talking about energy, built environment, and us people. That are not only consumers, but really uh, using all the solutions that we in the city and business level need to create for us that are <clears throat> easier to use and more attractive than, the, than the, the ones that we have today. And I think this is really the tricky bit. We've been talking about technologies and business models. I think they can be done, but how to change the, the, the mindset uh, for us all that we don't even see the changes anymore, that it's, it's the default to have more sustainable choices in our cities. Just quickly, um, how are we tackling this? Um, this is the, the operational model that we have. Uh, it's quite unique in the world. Uh, actually, Bruce Gutz from Brookings Institute said that, uh, Tina, I think you have a model for the future institutions uh, that really are combining cities and businesses and R&D communities and the state. And the way we work is that we have five cities here in the metropolitan region, we have 14 companies, uh, we have Citra, we have three universities and the Finnish government uh, donating us money for five years. And we are the operator. We are the small office accelerator, orchestrator, uh, kind of helping the community to build these ecosystems that make the big changes. Uh, and then there in the middle, you see the projects that are really the projects. So I'm not only having PowerPoints, we are actually, we have created seven projects in, in two years with 100 companies in them. And they relate to urban food, uh, uh, renovating buildings, uh, air quality modeling, um, mobility as a service solutions in, in traffic. 
But now the tricky part is that we have these great projects, but how do they scale up, as we discussed earlier? So I just want to, because we are running out of time soon, uh, say that uh, we have really learned that these permanent changes are made together. Cities really are powerhouses. They have the tools with public procurement, together with the state regulations, together with the great businesses, uh, to create these models that we can then all use. So thank you. Thank you, Dina Gahab. So, uh, next and the last little uh, presentation is from Anne Kaiser from uh, St. Cuba. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. And it's a very thankful position to be the last one to give the presentation. So, good luck. <laughs> Let's see. Left. So, I come from San Coban. Sorry for the pronunciation, I don't speak any French. And I'm the sustainability manager here in Finland. But just to put you in the picture what I'm talking about. So, San Coban is a global but also local company. I have almost 180,000 colleagues. I'm scared to go into our intranet. I go back quickly. But anyway, we have almost 41 billion of turnover, of which 75% comes from built environment. And that's actually a big thing when we talk about somebody. You mentioned the cities. Someone has been mentioning the population growth. and. It's, we are going to be 11 billion people, and most of them, I guess 90% will be living in the cities. So the construction will never end, because anyway, somebody has to live somewhere all the time. So it's a big stake for us. And what we are doing, we have a very, very, very versatile activity. So coming from insulation to gypsum to leka, it's a clay balls you use in construction. We have the Weber going for the plasters, floor screeds, whatever. But those are everywhere in the built environment. It's very difficult to go to a building where you don't see us. And once we take it, so I hope nobody takes this as a greenwashing, but we have set our new strategy. And actually what we aim to do, we don't want to be the traditional material producer anymore. As I'm working for San Coban, not for any of our single business activities. So I believe that we are much more interesting partner for doing the change together to discuss and progress the industry. And at the end, I find this pretty challenging that we want to help to create great living places and improve the daily life and provide well-being today and in the future. So, but we think it from the comfort side on the individual level. How do we feel in this room now? I'm sure the CO2, it will be lacking soon. And then we start yawning. That's about the comfort in daily life. But if we talk about the sustainability and we talk about the built environment, so the buildings are part of the problem, but they are also part of the solution. And Combining the sustainability where the circular economy, resource efficiency are huge things in built environment, which consumes 50% of the natural resources globally. But keep your fingers crossed that we could eventually make it if we are hurrying. But about the circularity, so these are like the three milestones, keystones we have in our sustainability strategy. So the zero carbon, circularity, and health and well-being in the built environment. So those are all like intertwining, but the circularity, as we are here talking today, and my head is pretty full of different kind of thoughts and ideas. So, but I try to stick in this my box, which is the built environment, and how do we see the circularity? So something is going wrong. There's a waste. We don't use the resources in a proper way. And we have the problem with the landfill. Nobody wants to put the things into landfill. And we are creating the in-vain costs 
which caused the economic losses for the whole society, not only for the companies or the cities, but even to the people. And the environmental impacts about the waste materials, those are also big issue, and usually they are negative. So toxic substances, that's one of the key issues what comes to the circularity in the built environment. If we take the buildings, their end of life, we have to know what has been put into the building, what were the substances in the materials. And uh, you mentioned the eco-design. So I have to mention here that in St. Goban we have these 3,700 R&D people, of which now 800 has been going through our eco-innovation program, which combines the environmental impacts and the health impacts of the products over their life cycle, plus the benefits for the buildings, comfort, people health, well-being, plus the local value creation. And so this is our own internal methodology. We will not label anything. We will use it for our R&D and communicating internally what does the sustainable circular product mean. And anyway, I mentioned the human health. It's with landfilling, with Toxic substances, those are huge things. And I actually, I read yesterday quickly, very quickly, it's a long report. The World Health Organization has published this report on the health and circular economy. So exporting waste, illegal waste management, toxic substances, those are huge things. So, And somehow, I'm not going through this, but we have mentioned the design. Buildings need to be designed, and they need to be checked on their whole life cycle. There's an end of life for everything. So this is much more complex issue that I could do now in this lacking time soon. But I just give some practical examples. So I'm not saying we are a circular company, but still we have a post-consumer materials that we actually want to have more. Just in the middle, you see the gypsum boards. Those are from construction and demolition waste. Last year, our Kirkonomi plant received 11 million kilos of recycled gypsum, but that's not enough for us. So anytime you hear somebody saying that it's not economically viable to recycle the gypsum, please ask them to call me. I can have a talk that we actually needed much more. And the same goes for the glass. And what comes here in the other picture, so on the, this, on that side. So for Weber, if anybody knows where to buy anything that I could replace the sand with, feel free. Again, I can, my number will be somewhere. So we are really looking for the alternative raw materials. And this is the last slide. So I just have to promote this. This is a program started with the Oulu University. It's called Wool to Loop. We are now waiting for the results for our second phase horizon call application that I submitted in the beginning of September. We want to turn the mineral wool in the construction and demolition waste that totals to 2.5 million tons in Europe annually, we want to turn it not to the gingerbreads, but we want to turn it to the concrete, ceramic, or even plastic-like materials. And there's pretty uh, nice consortium, so I think that all the ingredients for the catastrophe are existing, and it might become a project that I promise to coordinate. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anne Kaiser. Okay, so now we can go to the panel discussion. <laughs> so thank you all for those very interesting presentations. Uh, so let's go back to the first question that I already asked. So do we and do the companies still have time to change the way we use nature's resources? Just please very brief answers. Uh, Beatrice Bellini, if you can start, please. Um, we... we we don't have time, and um, um, as um, um, as Anne presents, it's uh, quite difficult to have uh, um, models that enable to think differently, because we always talked about sell of product, as uh, on your first slide, for example, and uh, we don't talked about uh, 
about city, I manage city, city, mobility, and things, a, a global view, a global point of view. And uh, um, the KPIs remain the same, and so we have to change the KPIs because I think that for the board director or for the top management of uh, Saint Gobain, it's very important to sell products. And, uh, and, and I think that. Uh, that they don't, even if they do things, I don't think that they can't sell them at a higher price. I, I don't know the competitors of Saint-Gobain, but I don't know the, the, the way to, to, to compete. But uh, I'm not sure that Saint-Gobain say we, have a, we are a French group, and so we have lots of very uh, hard lots to respect, and so uh, we sell uh, higher price our products. Uh, because there is less financial risk and reputational risk. I don't know if, uh, as a sustainable manager, you have this sort of, uh, of thinking. Uh, do you uh, want to answer the, the question? <laughs> no. Okay, so no. Yes, no. okay. that was a tricky one. <laughs> but we see the circularity, whatever, as a business mm -hmm. opportunity. And we have a talk about the legitimization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see, as a big company, that if we can tackle this thing and progress, the industry and the change. So then it's difficult for anybody to do it. But I would say that we are not talking about that we should sell products with the circular recycled content any cheaper, but neither any more expensive. So of course it's about the global common challenges, but also for us it's about the raw materials. So we don't actually try to find cheaper materials because we are actually lacking some materials already. The sand will end in the world. So it's really like the business prerequisites that we have. So, but did you ask about the plastics or the, do we have a time? Uh, no, it wasn't <laughs> about the plastics. It was just like a global question. Yeah, okay, if we so. still have the time to change really like the way how we use the nature, the nature's resources in the way that we need to change it okay. to be able so, to save the world. <laughs> yeah. I'm optimist. And even if you are conservative in the corporation, so I'm not. So I believe <laughs> in the things. So I believe that none, none of the companies alone can make it in time. But if we cooperate over the different sectors different we need all kind of cross scientific combinations take all the people with us nobody can do it alone but i believe that in cooperation and very unusual cooperation frameworks we maybe can make it so but i'm still optimist okay thank you very much actually for you dina uh, i would have a little bit different question it's related to this but to save time that we don't have a lot left so uh, in your opinion is it possible to extend the Helsinki Metropolitan model to entire Finland or even the entire world? Uh, the answer is yes, and actually I forgot to say it in my, in my presentation because I always say that feel free to, to copy it. And I'm, for example, discussing with C40 at the moment, uh, and they're very interested in the model. And what we could win in here is that uh, we have a five-year project where I'm convinced that uh, by 21, when we end, we have learned so much that we know what works, what doesn't work, but we have a very pragmatic uh, model that is, it looks simple in the paper, but it hasn't been simple to set it up and how to run it. But if we can now learn here in Helsinki and be like a test laboratory, I'm sure Paris or London and Singapore and other mega cities can do it in a bit different way, but they can use our learning. So definitely, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, we are now going to a different kind of subject, but you can keep the microphone. So I would like to talk about who has the responsibility. Companies, people, normal people, uh, governments, who has the main responsibility? For example, in, in France, there is a famous TV show of in investigative journalism called Cash Investigation. And they recently asked the leaders of some of the biggest plastic waste producers why they still do it. Like, why, why they produce plastic if it's so bad for the world? So some of them responded that normal people have the responsibility of what they consume and that companies just produce what is demanded. And this was very upsetting for many normal people, um, if we can say so. Uh, like, so, uh, Kalle Saarima, what is your opinion? 
to this? Who has the responsibility? That's a that's a very good question. And I would I would not point the responsibility actually to any any single uh, single party in in these value chains. I believe that. Um, we, we all are responsible. Companies are, is, are one part of the uh, uh, of, of the society, and how, how I see it, actually, um, I'm actually not being conservative. I was being realistic, um, uh, but uh, but the thing, for instance, I give an example. For instance, we as a Fortum, we are we are looking into investing in uh, carbon capture and storage in Norway. Why are we doing that in Norway? Because Norway has decided that they will spend money to that kind of a project to make their waste to energy plant more, more, more um, uh, sustainable. Could we do that in Finland? Uh, I would say it's, it, wouldn't, it would not be possible right now, because we, um, I would say that no company would survive if the company would not, in a given framework, work so that it would generate still profits. So companies need to still generate profits, and the society sets the boundaries where you can operate. But we, inside those boundaries, I believe that companies need to push and push those boundaries and act act a social, in a social manner within the given boundaries. But we can, can't expect that the companies, for instance, would stop producing plastics and make alternative products, even they might be even better for the environment. As As I, as I described, but, but to start making products that nobody would buy because people would still buy the cheap op uh, options. So I think society needs to set the boundaries and then companies need to act, act responsibly inside those boundaries. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question for you, Kalle Um uh, So Fortum is quite new in circular economy business. So what was your aim in entering to this new area? I think it, it fits very well to our uh, our, our mission. So uh, we have been uh, for long long already for a cleaner world, and this energy transformation is something that we've been we've been pressing and pushing very hard, and 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 we see that 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 is actually happening. So now it's only a logical step for us to start pushing the tr material transformation at the same time. And for me, energy and material uh, cycle there you can't actually. M to, to look them separately, even if the many politicians and political systems are looking energy policy and material policy as a separate thing, and they should not because they are part of the same same system where materials and energy circulate. So I, I think it fits very well to our our thinking. Okay, I, is it primarily a new way to make more money for a company like Fortum, or would do you think that? For example, a corporation like Fortum would be ready to lose a little bit money to do to work in circular economy so that in a way that it works better. If we look at what the investments we've been doing into this, for instance, the plastic recycling in Finland has been very difficult investment, not, not one of those that you can immediately start, ma start making money. Mm. This circular economy and recycling solutions are, are very, very difficult. And for instance, the CCS, uh, the carbon capture project in Norway, that's something that it, it's not actually so much out of a commercial project. Of course, we're not losing money with that, but that's not something that where we earn a lot of, lot of money. So I think we have a... We are, we are a company. Our aim is to, of course, make profits with, 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 with circular economy. But we are really pushing the boundaries and setting the ambition level high because we also believe that the world will develop to that direction. And it will be actually both. Circular economy will be good for society, but it will be good for business as well. And I don't see that they need to be in conflict in any way. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Stefan Poirier from Helsinki, you are from a very different kind of a company than Fortum. What is the role of a small local company in creating equality in circular economy in comparison to a huge company, for example? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. What, what's the, what is our role? Yeah, how do you see in, in the, the role? In the global like as as a company or uh, in in for the, the yeah world. like as a company as a small local company how do you see your role in creating m m more equal uh, more equality to to people uh, in a smaller scale of course well i i think the equality is maybe more a matter of of the pol policy of the company than than is it small or big because um 
uh, at least as long as I'm part of the decision makers, we will not have a 200 times difference between uh, the hand workers and, uh, and the heads. And that's a policy that you decide as a, as, as a decider. Uh, and that's, I think, a so social responsibility of, of any company decider. Uh, in my opinion, two is already very big, two or three, actually. Uh, when people say that 20 would be good, but what is 20? I mean, why do you need 20 car cars when the other one can ha have one and I, whatever? But, um, but otherwise, the, the role of uh, any company, including small ones, uh, if we believe in what we do is maybe to show a model and and to show that this model can work. Uh, so it has to work in all ways that we have talked. So socially, uh, financially, uh, economically, all, uh, and, and of course, uh, sustainably. But um, it's not always easy because, uh, and, and there I, I, I joined what, what uh, this Minister uh, of Environment, uh, Nicola Hulot, had said, that we, we are, facing some lobbyists and then it's not fair for us like mm -hmm. that's why i mentioned this these mushrooms which are not uh which are not grant we don't get grants because um i think it was you uh who said that we uh, we should not get grants because uh, we should be uh uh, we, we should be profitable, and I agree, but then if the others get grants, then it's as if we would get a, a, a minus. And uh, uh, our mushrooms are more expensive than the chicken in the supermarket, and we cannot compete because uh, these chickens get grants. And, and in that way, we, ha we, we want to show a model, but we still face uh, some uh, barriers which are part of an ancient, ancient rules which have to be really, really uh, thought again. So the, your main problems come from the system, not from the ordinary people adopting new ways of uh, consuming? No, no. no. The, the, I think the consumers or the people are far uh, above or further than uh, some rules or even some companies. Okay. Because some companies know they go into the wall. I, if I think oil extractors, they have known from the beginning they go into the wall. Uh, but uh, each day between now and the wall is a lot of money. And uh, so they will keep piling the money un un unless uh, some rule changes. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we could maybe have time for one question from the audience. There is... Yeah. <laughs> Are two people. <laughs> Hi, uh, Julia Kendall from an international development ag agency called Tier Fund. Um, I was really pleased, Anne, that you mentioned in your talk about the human health impacts of waste. Um, and my question for the panel is, um, how can European business design and innovation not just um, improve things within Europe, but also improve the opportunities for people living in developing countries as well, as they're the ones that bear the cost of environmental pollution and health damage, but also have job opportunities from remanufacture and repair of that waste. And so we want to continue to tackle inequality through that job creation, but also tackle the health and environmental impact. So what's the role of European innovation and business in that. Si, no, c'est bon. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm really surprised sometimes because we talked a lot about smart cities. Uh, in particular in developing countries. And when we saw all the tower we built uh, with <laughs> green green approach, because now in developing city, uh, I was in, in Bogota and there is a lot and lot of buildings and I, and I changed with people that built. And uh, when I ask if they are green managing of the building, he smile and say, yes, yes, all is green here. And so I um, think that we have to be careful because sometimes, for example, in Africa, so we, we don't need smart city with a lot of, lot of uh, raw materials. Which we have other way to, 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 to think about cities and the, the, the role of the cities. And uh, it's, it's uh, it, 
we have to think with a functional economy methodology with self cities too, I think. And sometimes it's very, uh, for me, it's like a fake industry when we, sp when we speak about smart cities. Ah, and uh, we see some, uh, I'm afraid of this because it's quite a uh, uh, marketing approach. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so thank you for the question. So there were a few points coming. So thinking about us like a company and this, thing I'm having here, an example of these new geopolymer materials that I believe in. So we are able even to scale up. We are operating in 67 countries. So whatever, if we create a, some good thing that is like proactive and solving some of the biggest problems in the built environment, so we are able to scale and we are ready to share it. And we are looking for the industrial ecosystems, the business ecosystems. Many times I'm asked like, but whatever, but if there's the rock wall inside that mineral wall, it's your competitor. I don't, who cares? That's a common problem. And what we want to drag into this is to get the startups, get the companies, get the new people, create some work. And of course, what is coming for the human health here? So it's that we have to study the solutions for the future on their life cycle. And then still for this green building, whatever. So in Finland, so we made a research in June. We asked people about the well-being in the built environment. One of the questions was, how interested are you in the ecological building? There are many ways to interpret this. I don't know whether they meant the green buildings, lead Braham, and so on. So it was two-thirds are uh, interested in the ecological building. But when they were asked, do you pay attention on the certification schemes or any product approval, like M1 we have in Finland or ME code in Europe? No, nobody. But still, that's our work anyway to promote the industry, or first in Europe and then to get further. So. Uh, sorry, actually, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm sorry that maybe not all of you could uh, answer this last one question. Uh, so, uh, we still have one last question to you, anyways. So uh, this seminar is especially about, has been especially about Finland and France. You, many of you come from the, these countries. So I would like to address the last question to our keynote speaker, Beatrice Bellini. Uh, what can Finland and France teach each other in this cir circular economy matters? Where could they cooperate maybe more than at the moment? Um, yes, I'm sure that uh, it's very important to develop the <coughs> exchange of, uh, of uh, scientists, for example, researchers, uh, um, firms. Um, uh, I, I think that the culture, different way to, to, for example, the sense of life in Finland is very different, I'm sure, that sense of life in France. Right. And uh, I think it's very, uh, we must understand each people what they want and uh, uh, I, I want to, what is our need, what we need and uh, do we need such we have or such we, I think it's very important people, a uh, question to, to, to think about that, the sense of life and the needs and the way we can answer to this, to this question together. And uh, perhaps with um, the chair, because in the, in the chair positive business, we have around uh, 20 countries. And it's very interesting because the way to consider things are very different in Cameroon, in Colombia, in Vietnam, or in China. And uh, it, it, I think the, 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 the real solution must be local. I don't think we, we, we talked about local. And I think we must adapt it to local um, local situation, and uh, when we we teach <laughs> we teach student now, uh, um, uh, we have to uh, think global and act local. It's not possible to think global and after act local because when we say, for example, hall must be yellow. After it's difficult to say, hey, for me it's better green. No, yellow, uh, but not. Uh, so we have to to to. To, um, to work with that. Thank you. 
Now, uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. So thank you all our panelists. And it's time for the closing remarks from Kari Herlevi from Citra. Welcome. This one. All right. Third one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm between the cocktails and, and you, so I'll be very brief in that sense. I, I think we started uh, with, with very high level discussions about the G20, G7 European presidency, and I think when was asked how Finland and France could collaborate, at least both countries have circular economy roadmaps, so I think that is a great starting point for. Uh, work in uh, more specific fields of policy and, and uh, cities and, and businesses and, and citizen level. So I think it's a great starting point. And uh, I think one of the key things was to really think about uh, the kind of aspects of, uh, you know, get rid of poverty at the same time as, as well as, as, as Alex was. Uh, talking and, and I think that is a very relevant thing and I think it's too little talked in the circular economy area. I was very fascinated about the concrete examples also and I was kind of uh, somehow one of the examples was uh, the paid to cycle in Netherlands. I, I think it's uh, fascinating this kind of uh, models which have uh, economic incentives as well. I think it usually helps to, to speed up things. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we can continue discussions and I would like to thank all the moderators.